Thanks, Garrett. Hey, everybody. Hey, graduates. How are you? Good. Good. I have something on my heart uh, to share with everybody, but in particular uh, with you. And uh, Janet and I were having a conversation. We were laying in bed. I reached over and I turned off the light. And then I reached back over and turned it on. I said, sorry, babe. And I sat up for about 10 minutes. And what I'm going to share with you is what I felt like God gave me sort of unexpectedly at that moment. Now, I ended up working it out over the next uh, week or so. But uh, I really feel that it's a, an appropriate message for uh, this specific time. And we are so proud of you. Yeah. And again, we're grateful to the family members <clears throat> that have supported them and that have come out here to support them as they uh, uh, graduate tonight. I want to talk to you about four things. Purpose, patience, prayer, and perspective. First one, purpose. God has a plan for you, for every one of us. The scripture says in Ephesians 2 and verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And if you back up just a little bit into the first chapter, the beforehand means before God ever even formed the earth, before the foundation of the world, God thought about us, and he planned pathways for us to walk on and works for us to do. Your life is not some afterthought. God has things for each of us to do. We have a purpose. That same verse from the Passion Translation says this, We have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the Anointed One. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. Before we were born, God gave us a destiny and he planned out the good works that we would do to fulfill that destiny. And you know what? It's not meant to be some big mystery from us that we somehow can't know. That same book, chapter 5 and verse 17 says, therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And you know, God would be quite cruel if he commanded us to understand his will and then didn't give us the means to understand it. But he does give us the means. In fact, the very next verse tied to that, verse 18, says don't be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, dissipation or excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And one of the ways that we know and that we can't get around is we have to spend time with the Holy Spirit. We have to stay full of the Spirit and fellowship with the Spirit. And I think, of, you know, in addition, a, a good gauge if we are walking along that pathway that God has laid out for us is we need to ask ourselves, do I have satisfaction in the way I'm walking, in the direction my life is going, in the things that I'm doing, is there satisfaction? And that's not to say that there's not going to be rough patches in life as we pursue the will of God, because there will be rough patches. That doesn't mean there will not be times of great stress, because there will be when you'll be thinking, man, I, I need to take a very long vacation right now. But you know what? Underneath it all, there should be a great satisfaction as we pursue our destiny and live out those prearranged good works. In Isaiah 55 and verse 2, God asks these questions. He said, why do you spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? What a question. Why do you labor? Why do you spend your labor on that which does not satisfy? I have a friend that is a young man. He was a top executive in a global um, record company. In fact, if I mention the label, everyone in the building would know it. He was making a huge amount of cash, but he was dissatisfied. And he read that verse from Isaiah 55 and 2. Why do you labor for that which doesn't satisfy? He put his resignation in that very day. And he went on 
to raise up a number of very successful businesses that, that were, you know, just, just came out of his heart that he created, has been highly successful, very prosperous, but had a great influence for the kingdom of God in his country and on my life. You know, personally, he's had a great influence, but he didn't carry on, even though there was a lot of cash to be had in something that didn't satisfy. You know, if you don't know what to do next, if you're in that stage trying to work it out, all right, I've got a destiny, God's got a purpose, what is it, I'm not sure, what do I do? Well, what you do is you stay where you are right now, and you stay faithful there. You know, my wife Janet, she was an RN and um, got saved, went to Bible school because she felt a call into gospel ministry, knew she was supposed to be involved in a greater way in, in bringing the gospel to the world. And she graduates from Bible school and she went into a tizzy. She's thinking, well, well what do I do now? You know, do, do I, 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 I volunteer at a missions organization? Do I, I try and get on staff in a church? What do I do? Do I stay at my job? What do I do? What do I do? And her pastor very wisely told her, you stay faithful at your job, and when the time comes, God will open the doors of opportunity for you. And God did that. You know, Saul was anointed king over Israel by Samuel. And Samuel said to him, do what your hand finds to do. So you know what Saul did? He went back to taking care of his father's oxen. And he was faithful doing that. And then the door of opportunity opened and he rescued the men of Jabesh Gilead and the whole nation recognized the anointing upon him and he became the king of Israel. David was anointed as king. The spirit of God came upon him. It was announced that he was to be king. What did he do? He went back to shepherding. Went back and faithfully took care of his father's flocks until the doors opened. And then he ruled over Judah for seven and a half years and eventually over all of Israel. 1 Corinthians 7.20 says, So everyone should continue to live faithful in the situation in life of life in which they were called to follow Jesus. I like the Living Bible. It says, usually a person should keep on with the work he was doing when God called him. I have a friend. He was the sound engineer for a rock band called ACDC for eight years. Traveled the world with them and indulged deeply in the, the lifestyle associated with, um, you know, rock bands of that era, very excessive and he was re actually on the tour bus with a lot of craziness going on on the bus, and he was reading a Christian book someone gave him, and he gave his heart to Christ sitting on the tour bus. You know what he did next? He continued being the sound engineer <laughs> for ACDC for another eight months. And then God began to deal with him and opened a door, and he actually went on to pastor several very successful churches and the last time that I spoke with him, he was, he was actually a, uh, an instructor at one of the nation's premier seminaries. But he stayed where he was until he knew what to do next, until he had a clear leading from God. But friend, you do, and listen, every one of you graduates, you do have a purpose. You do have a destiny. And right now, you're in a particular season of life. And you know, the overall calling may not change, but there's going to be a new season, and God will lead you in that. But you stay faithful where you are until God opens the next door for you. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is patience. Patience. Hebrews 6.12 says, So don't allow your hearts to grow dull or lose your enthusiasm. But follow the example of those who fully received what God has promised because of their strong faith and patient endurance. Listen, significant lives and significant legacies are not built in a day. The prize belongs to the patient. William Carey labored for seven years in India before he saw his first Hindu convert. Judson labored seven years in Burma 
before there was the first person converted to Christ. There was 20 years of missionary gospel work that went on in New Zealand before the first Maori gave his life to Christ. And those labors laid the foundation for what would eventually turn into millions of conversions worldwide. Because people even today consider William Carey the father of modern missions. What a legacy. But woven into it from beginning all the way to the end is patience. You know, if you travel around the world at all, doesn't matter where you go, you go into a, a, a bathroom in a restaurant or a bathroom in an airport, everywhere you go they have those Dyson hand dryers. You wash your hand and they work great. And Dyson Company makes fans and other things as well. And I actually looked it up today and uh, their revenue is over, well over $3 billion a year. And it all started when James Dyson invented the bagless vacuum cleaner. Some of you might have a Dyson vacuum cleaner. But you know what? It wasn't just like, wow, I've got this great idea, and six months later, he's leading this lucrative company. Guess how many prototypes he went through before he had his vacuum created? 50? 75? 150? 5,127 prototypes. 14 years of debt and lawsuits before he ever created his first product. You see, he was committed to a process and patiently pursued it. You've got to be patient. We're in this for the long haul. And I think it's essential as well to understand that as we patiently pursue God's plan for our lives, that God wants us to enjoy the journey. It's on the journey that we learn the lessons. It's on the journey that we make friends. It's on the journey that our faith is developed. It's on the journey that we experience God's faithfulness. And you know, I've done a lot of backpacking in my life, and it's always kind of a drag to go backpacking with someone that doesn't enjoy the journey. It's like, how much longer is this going to be? We've been walking for two days. How many more switchbacks is there going to be? And, you know, it's not just about the destination. It's about stopping and getting a, a drink out of a crystal clear, ice-cold river. It's about stopping in the middle of the trail and listening to the quiet and the wind as it blows through the tops of the pine trees. It's about drinking in the panoramas that continually open up to you. You should just stare and wonder at God's creation. It's about conversation and laughter with your friends along the trail. And yeah, the destination is great, but it's not just about the destination. It's about the journey. God gives us grace to enjoy the journey. Number three, prayer. Listen to me, graduates. We are in a spiritual battle. Much of the opposition that you are facing now and that you will face, though it may present itself as physical and natural, is actually spiritual in nature. Be that an antagonistic neighbor, a council member, or a local government that has set themselves against you, an unexpected lawsuit, the sudden headwinds that make forward progress so difficult, be they headwinds of financial lack, public sentiment, or strife from within. Most of that is spiritual in nature, and the victory can only be won upon our knees. There are no shortcuts around it. Listen to these verses from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, 17 and 18. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand or stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, 
against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always. Can we say that? Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Prayer. You know, I, I had the privilege in my life to become acquainted with a man named Till Osborne, one of the greatest soul winners that, that history has ever known. He's been in heaven for a number of years now. And he carried on massive crusades for decades and decades throughout Latin America, Europe, Asia, throughout Africa. And I remember it was probably 1980, might have been even 1979, I was in a meeting and Till Osborne's crusade director was speaking. His crusade director would actually go into whatever country or you know, city in that country he was going to be holding a crusade like three months ahead of time, six months ahead of time, and it was up to him to secure all the government permits that were necessary. It was up to him to hire out the bull ring or the, the football stadium or the uh, open air place where they could have an open air you know, meeting with, with 50 or 60,000 people there. It was up to him to try and get the churches to all work together. And he said, almost always things would go wrong and we would reach an impasse, and it seemed absolutely impossible. I'll never forget what he said. He said, I cannot tell you how many times I ended up on my face back in my hotel room, agonizing all night long before God in prayer until the victory came. He says, and then things would turn, and we always got the things we needed, whether it was the you know, open air side or the bull ring or the necessary permits or whatever, but the battle was won in prayer. Friends, strategy is good, strategy is necessary, but we must pray. The people that are not praying are straying. Prayer enlists the help of God. Listen, on our own, we do not have what it takes to accomplish our assignment. We don't. We need help from above. We need supernatural help. And I know there's some people that'll be here tonight. You're engaged in some, you know, arena of business and you've taken things as far as they can go. You are stretched financially, you are stretched emotionally, and you don't know what else to do. You need help from heaven. You need help from the one who can open doors that no man can shut and can shut doors that no man can open. Pray. We must pray. We'll never see God's plan fulfilled in our lives if we don't become people of prayer. And then finally, perspective. How we see ourselves. Number one, we need to see ourselves as soldiers. Number two, we need to see ourselves as sowers. Soldiers and sowers. 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. Soldier. This is like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Share in the hard times with us. A soldier does not take part in things that don't have anything to do with the army. He wants to please his commanding officer. There's two things I see here. Number one, hard times go with the calling. He said, share in the hard times with us. Don't be surprised by them. Don't be the soldier that says, what the heck's going on? The enemy's shooting at me. Well, what did you think? We're in a war. You have an enemy. And they're going to try and take you out. We do go through hard times. There will be battles and toughness is required. Listen, it takes guts to follow Jesus. We're swimming upstream in a downstream world and it takes courage to serve Jesus. Wherever you live, whatever you know, type of, of ministry, calling you know, that, that God has designed for you, to be a witness for Christ and to live for the glory of God will take courage on your part. Endure hardness as a good soldier. Secondly, we need to have the perspective and see ourselves as sowers. But there, there's, there's actually one more thing with a soldier that I want to mention that I see. It means that we're under command. The soldier wants to please 
him that's his commander. Which means we need to, number one, listen for those commands. And number two, be prompt to obey, not debate, but to obey those commands. I met a guy just a couple days ago, or was talking to him. I'd met him previously, and he shared a story with me. He actually interviewed the man and, and wrote it in a, a book that he was doing, this guy's story. The guy's name is Daryl. Daryl lived in a small town in Missouri. He had a little business where he made water tanks for farms, and he, he did okay, went to a small Pentecostal church in this little Missouri town. They had a guest speaker in. The guest speaker, you know, in the middle of his message or when he was done, announced, he said, this is the word of the Lord. The Lord says, don't worry about the church debt. The church debt will be paid off. <clears throat> well, Daryl heard that and thought, oh, that's great. After service, Daryl's out in the parking lot, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and says, the debt will be paid off. And you're going to pay it off. <laughs> and you're going to do it through fishing. And the Holy Spirit actually told him two largemouth bass fishing tournaments that he would win. Now, Daryl was a fisherman. He'd actually fished in some little regional tournaments. But you don't just walk out and fish on, on the, you know, the bass tour. You have to qualify. It's just like you don't walk out and play on the PGA golf tour. You have to qualify to do it. And so he actually qualified for this first tournament. It was the biggest thing he'd ever been in, and he won it. I think he won $100,000 in that tournament, went and put $40,000 it immediately to pay the church debt down. And the, the church debt was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, which was big money you know, for them in that little town. And that actually, him winning that tournament, qualified him to fish in the Bassmasters. That year it was taking place in Florida. And the first two days, they fish Thursday and Friday. And if you, you know, you, you catch your fish, you take them in, you, you weigh them. And if you have enough, then you qualify and you get to fish on Saturday and Sunday. But if you don't make the cut, you, that's it. You go home. And uh, when he got out there, he had a kidney stone attack. He's in a lot of pain. Called home. People are praying for him. And he fished anyway. Thursday was a lousy day. Hardly caught anything. Friday... He's got one fish in the live well. He's caught one little bass. And he's so discouraged, he has to be back to the dock at the weigh-in station by 3 o'clock. It's 2.20, and it's going to take him 30 minutes to get back. And he's so discouraged, Daryl closed up all of his tackle boxes, laid his pole down, sat on the deck of his little boat, discouraged, and God, I thought you told me that I was going to win this tournament. I got one stinking fish. I'm not going to qualify. And he said, suddenly, the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, one more cast. He said, okay, open up the tackle box, tied a lure on, got a rod. One cast caught a six-pound bass. Another cast caught another nice bass. Another cast caught another nice bass headed over, got to the weigh-in station just in time, and he qualified and went on to win. You know, after fishing Saturday and Sunday, he won $660,000, <laughs> went back and paid off the church debt. And he has never won another <laughs> bass tournament, not a one, since that day. But God has prospered his little tank business. He's actually a multimillionaire through that, that tank business that he does for the farms. But we have to listen to the command of Jesus, our commanding officer. See ourselves as soldiers and then as sowers. Everybody say sowers. sowers. We need to see ourselves as sowers. You can't have a harvest where no seeds have been sown. And you know, God's promise in 2 Corinthians 9 and 10 is that he provides seed to the sower and bread for food. Meaning he always gives us something to give, seeds to sow. And when he says bread for food, that's a promise that God will meet our personal needs while we're sowing, doing what we do, investing to help other people, whatever that means to you. While we're sowing. But, but the truth is, God, God gives us bread to eat. He supplies our need. But listen carefully to me. In reality, as sowers, 
we may be planting for a future that is not ours. It is so important that we imbibe this perspective. We may be sowing for a future that is not ours. Jesus said in John 4, 37 and 38, he said, for in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. You know, here at Cottonwood Church, we do a lot with television. We've done some things here domestically, but the lion's share of what we do is international. We get on secular channels around the world and put it into the language of the people. We subtitle or dub it into Arabic and Farsi and German and French and Dutch and Spanish and Nepali and Russian. We've done Hindi and we've done Japanese. And you know what? Maybe... God will allow us to reap, but maybe not. It may be someone else that's going to come along and reap a very rich harvest of human souls in those lands where we have sowed and where people have invested prayer and invested finances and we've invested time. We've been sowing and sowing, and God's been faithful to give us bread to eat all the while. He's met our needs. And, you know, just perhaps those that thrust in the sickle and reap in those nations... And among all those people groups, maybe they'll realize that they're entering into someone else's labors. Maybe they'll realize that the harvest they're reaping is because other people wept and other people prayed and other people gave and other people sacrificed, other people sowed so that they could enter into it. Listen, if we do this thing right, whatever it is you're called to do in life, if you do it right, it will outlive you. It's got to be bigger than us. It has to outlive us. You know, as I I come to a close, I just want to, just for a moment, think about that that whole idea of one sowing and another reaping. I think it's probably true of many of us here. There was a lot of God fingerprints on our life from different moments where somebody shared with us or we read something or we saw something or we had an experience that made us think about God. And then the time came that we, we prayed and, and literally gave our lives to Christ. But it was because somebody faithfully sowed prayers and faithfully gave their witness, you know, faithfully di- did whatever. And you just may be here tonight. Maybe you came to support a family member and you're just kind of not into this whole thing. But you know what? I suspect there's some God fingerprints on your life. I suspect that somewhere somebody cast some seeds into the soil of your heart. Maybe when you were a child, maybe in Sunday school, maybe you read a tract somewhere. Maybe you made fun of some guy that was preaching by the Huntington Beach Pier. You thought, what an idiot. But even while you were saying that, you were listening to what he was saying. Something happened to you. And here you are tonight. I don't think it's a coincidence. Now maybe, maybe, I'm just sowing seeds, but maybe, just maybe, you're ready to commit your life to the Savior. You know if you are. I suspect the Holy Spirit has been working in your life. And the the great news, this is not about ritual and ceremony and rules and regulations. It's about relationship. That's what God wants. He wants to be a father to us. He wants to walk with us and talk with us. But it's only as we come to him through his son, Jesus Christ. Sin stands as an impenetrable barrier between mankind and God. God sent his own son, Jesus, to remove that barrier. He died for the sin of the world. The penalty for our sins fell upon him. He died in our place. The claims of God's justice were satisfied, and Jesus was raised from the dead. And the Bible says if you believe it, and if you're willing to embrace him, submit your life to him as Lord, God brings you into a relationship, and that relationship is called salvation. Just for a minute, everybody in the house, if you wouldn't mind... Bow on your heads, closing your eyes. I want to invite you to pray with me. You need to realize God sees your heart right now. This is an important moment for you. If you're a backslider, 
a prodigal son, a prodigal daughter. There, there may be people in your world that wouldn't ever suspect that you've had an encounter with God at some point in your life, but you know it's true. God has been wooing you and he's been drawing you and he's been faithful. And right now he's saying, will you open your heart? Because his heart is open to you. I want to lead you in a simple prayer. The words in themselves have no power, but when there's a sincere heart tied around the words and they're spoken to God, that changes things. Are you ready? Want to make your peace with God? Pray this prayer after me. Say, oh God, I come to you tonight in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. I believe he died for the sin of the world. And I believe that he was raised from the dead. Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you would give your life for me. I ask you to come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I commit my all to you, Jesus. And I hold nothing back. Here's my life. I trust in you. Amen. Go ahead and look up this way. Thank you.